Now, today is International Youth Day. However, millions of young people in South Africa are challenged by both unemployment and poverty. The ailing economy and the rising cost of living continues to be a major concern. Some, some experts are warning the country is at risk of becoming a failed state. The latest crime stats paint a grim picture. The backdrop is a continuing theme of corruption, enrolling blackouts, water shortages, a shaky healthcare system, well, and myriad other state failures. Others say system. this is the cost so of so corruption and negligent leadership. John Henry Steenhuisen is the leader of the DA and the leader of the opposition in parliament. He started his career in politics early, serving first as an activist and then as a branch member of the Democratic Party. Mr. Steenhuisen's first elective office was as a city councillor for Durban North in 1999, at which point the Democratic Party had become the Democratic Alliance following its union with the new National Party. He served as a town councillor until 2006 when he was elected caucus leader. In 2009, he was elected to the KZN legislature and also elected the provincial leader of the DA, a post he held until late 2010. He was elected to the National Assembly in 2011 and then appointed shadow minister of cooperative governance and traditional affairs. In 2014, Musi Maimani appointed him the chief whip of the DA parliamentary caucus a position he held until 2019, after which he became interim party leader following Maimani's resignation from the party. <clears throat> Since then, he has led the party with a focus on showing voters what the DA can provide to them, and it is my honour today to talk to him about exactly that. Hello, John. How Hello. are you doing? Good, thanks. And you, Gabriel. Great to be with you I'm today. I'm doing very well, thanks. So well, I want to start yeah. with a little bit of a personal history. Mm -hmm. So where did you grow up? So I grew up in Durban North, which is a suburb just north of Durban, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, I've spent the first 25 uh, years of my life uh, in Durban North. Um, and and so where did you go to school? So I went to Northwood Boys High School, Chelsea Drive Preparatory School, and then Northwood Boys High School. It used to be uh, two schools in the area, Northlands and Beechwood, and then they amalgamated to form Northwood. Okay, and so... I'm wondering, what were the major political influences on you growing up? Um, I come from a, a, a very apolitical family. My family have never been involved in politics, and certainly no one in the family has been involved in politics. Um, I suppose growing up in Durban North, the influences there was mainly around the PFP. It was one of the few seats um, that the party held during some tough elections, and we were able to you know, have successive uh, PFP MPs. Um, and we were able to make sure that they were, you know, that they were the sort of political leaders in our community, mm -hmm. and then also through our councillors as well. So, uh, people like Mike Ellis, people like uh, Roger Burrows, who were very active in, in the PFP at that time, uh, and big influences. Yeah. And so, when did your interest in politics really start mm -hmm. then? So it started when I was at school. Okay. Uh, you know, I got involved with the the DP then when when I was still at school. And it was just something I was always interested in. I thought, um, you know, it's politics affects every aspect of our life. And you know, South Africa was busy going through that transition and change. So politics was, it was very much at the fore of people's minds uh, in those uh, in the early nineties. So it, yeah, it was a, a source of, uh, of of interest that it was in the news. The country was moving. Uh, there was referendums, all those sorts of things happening. And it, it piqued the interest in, in politics. And the an interest that uh, hasn't gone away since, yeah, I can no. see. <laughs> and so um, you are obviously the leader of the DA, but uh, the DA wasn't always the DA. It has roots going back deep into the parliamentary opposition to apartheid. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, where do you see the kind of start of the DA, even though that probably wasn't what it was called at that time? And could you take me briefly through the history of the party from that point. Yeah, so I think the start of, of the DA as we know it today would probably be the breakaway of Helen Sussman and seven others from the old United Party uh, mm -hmm. to form the Progressive Party. Uh, they broke away because of the whole issue of qualified franchise mm -hmm. uh, and some other issues where they felt the United Party was not taking a strong enough 
initiative on non-racialism in South Africa. So they broke away and formed a, a small party called the Progressive Party that eventually became the Progressive Federal Party, uh, and that then transformed into the Democratic Party in the during the uh, late 80s. And then the DP's merger with the NNP and the Federal Alliance led to the creation in 2000 of the of the DA. Mm -hmm. um, and and so we, we've got a proud history of uh, of people who've stood on the right side of history. People like Colin Eglin, people like Helen Sussman, people like Joe Ceremoni and others who've been a big part of, of who we are as a, an organization and who've, who've been leading lights in the cause of non-racialism uh, in South Africa. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the, uh, the cause of non-racialism in South Africa because the political context has certainly changed in the country since the P PP was started, the Progressive Party. Um, and I was wondering though, have there been any major shifts in the core beliefs of the party since that time and maybe if there have been what those shifts are? So I think if you, if you, look, at, um, if you look at the, at the history of, of the party but also trace the history of liberalism, Lib liberalism itself has, has transformed and changed. I mean, the whole essence of liberalism is about being open to change and, and new ideas and new evidence when it emerges. But I would say that the core foundational beliefs of the party have not changed. And they're the same core foundational beliefs. These are non-racialism, uh, where you don't see people as an envoy of their race. You see people as individuals, and you focus on the primacy of the individual and making sure that that, that they are, uh, you know, are given the choice to be able to uh, live the life that they wish to live in, in a way uh, that they want to. The second one is respect for the rule of law and the constitution. So it's about having a, a solid uh, set of rules which applies to society and that one of those principles is equality before the law uh, and ensuring that, that those institutions that are responsible for uh, administering to, uh, the law remain relatively independent. Then um, a social market economy which sees business and, and uh, the private sector as partners in growth and job creation, uh, not as enemies, mm -hmm. but also understands that the state is an actor and that there is a role for the state, but the state must know what that role is and it shouldn't crowd out private enterprise. And finally, the building of a capable state, a state that's able to deliver on the programs uh, of, of the government of the day, uh, a state that's staffed and by competent professionals and people who are there on the ability to do the job. And um, <clears throat> does the DA kind of see a tension between the individualism that uh, you try to promote and the building of a capable state? How do you kind of, how do you see the DA trying to navigate the line between government overreach and ensuring individual rights? Well, I think that one of the, the, the ways, to, particularly in terms of building the capable state, would be around how you appoint people to the civil service. Um, we think that just saying that you've got to have people of a certain color or a certain language uh, for, for a certain position is wrong, that you should appoint the best person for the job and that that should be done on merit and on individual merit. Um, part of the reason why we have state capture today is because of something called cater deployment, which saw certain positions as reserved for people of a certain race or certain political class or certain political membership. And it was filled on that basis, on the basis of know who, not know how. And, and that's why we have so many uh, moribund government departments and why so many of our state and entities were a complete failure. Because the focus wasn't on individual merit. It was on the interests of the party and, and, and those, those aspects and on ticking some you know, racial equation. And so I would kind of like to move into talking about then what the DA has managed to achieve being guided by these uh, this ideology and so in your opinion what are the three biggest achievements of the DA in government? Well I would say first amongst them is being able to govern well and to govern in a way that is accountable and govern in a way that delivers so you would could you give me an example? Well, we've of built a capable state here in the in the Western Cape, a government uh, administration that receives clean audits across the board, the only uh, f uh, provincial government in the country that receives clean audits 
from the Auditor General and is able to deliver. And that's reflected on the other two uh, in that one of those is job creation, you, where you have good, clean, accountable government that delivers. You're able to attract investment, and it's why it is uh, much easier to find a job in the Western Cape and why the unemployment rates here are full 16 points lower than the rest of the country. Uh, and then thirdly, on, on being able to deliver services. And on every single metric, uh, whether it's government's own uh, service delivery reports, whether it's the Auditor General, whether it's independent um, reports like the Universal Household Access to Basic Services report, the DA is providing clean water, electricity, um, good services to many, many more households. And I think that it's that delivery message and being able to, to do that delivery, to do it well, uh, that I think is, is let's put the D on a very good footing. And uh, would you say that um, you're starting to be able to do the same things in the places in which you govern in coalition, for example, in Johannesburg and Pretoria? It's a lot harder in coalition. Yeah. It's a lot harder when you're in coalition. It's a lot easier when you've got you know, your hands on the steering wheel and you're able to steer the ship in the direction you want it to go. Yeah. It's a lot harder when you've got you know, eight other hands on the steering wheel, each wanting to, to pull in their own direction. And we saw in Cape Town, as an example, was an eight-party coalition when Helen Zilla took over. Mm. And we now have an absolute majority there. It's a lot easier for Mayor Hill Lewis to be able to decide on a course of action and implement it immediately a lot harder for someone like uh, Mayor Randall uh, Williams, to, who's now going to bring a number of coalition partners along. So I think it does slow down service delivery in some aspects, but it is a reality, and it's, you know, it's better than not being in government. Yeah. And I would say it's a reality that you guys are going to have to uh, face come uh, the next set of national elections. Um, and so uh, I'd like to kind of move into this uh, into the plans for government and your kind of policy agenda uh, and I'll focus it around first um, what you said in your podcast with Mac G uh, was mm -hmm. that you stated that the four most important issues that need to be tackled in the country are number one electricity, number two corruption, number three education and number four employment. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Um, and so let's start with the issue of national electricity prov mm -hmm. provision you are pro privatization of electricity and so why is privatization the best way to deal with national electricity provision because i think having a monopoly is a is a terrible situation to find yourself in that a open liberalized market for a key service like electricity will do a number of things firstly it reduces your reliance on a single supplier secondly it creates competition amongst the providers uh, which leads inevitably to better deals as they compete for the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, and a consumer is able to switch between a number of different suppliers. We saw with cell phones, for instance, when it was dominated by only two players, um, the prices were high. As soon as more players entered the market, the price for data, for cell phone calls, fell. And I fundamentally believe that that is going to happen. I also think it's a huge opportunity for a greenfield job creation project in South Africa, opening up a whole new industry of renewable energy, of, of alternative energy sources, I think is a huge source of economic uh, opportunity for South Africa, particularly for young, for young people who would like to enter an innovative you know, new market space. Um, <clears throat> and do you not, but do you not worry that uh, in trying to privatize ESCOM that uh, the, the grid as it is constructed currently is not going to be able to be privatized and cut up? Is that, not, is that a problem that you can... Oh, I think, it's, I think it's, it can be overcome. It's been overcome in many countries that have embarked upon similar processes. Um, I think that you know, it is certainly better than the current situation where we are reliant on a single producer of electricity, a single distributor of electricity, and we're at the mercy of them for a number of things, pricing, quality and the like there's nobody else to go to if you don't like Eskom you know you can maybe go off grid it's very expensive and out of the realm of a lot of people who who you know are big consumers of electricity uh, at a domestic level um, but I fundamentally believe that we've got to find the ways to do it because the current model is broken and you can try and breathe life into Eskom as much as you want you can continue to pour money into Eskom as much as you want 
you can even form another ESKIM, as Gwede Mantashe wants to do, to oversee the recovery of the current ESKIM. Um, it's not going to work. Uh, you've got to do something different. And I think it's an area where the private sector can do better than a government monopoly. And how would you answer the kind of reply that the private sector doesn't, isn't incentivized then to give and provide electricity to the people that need it the most, the people that necessar can't necessarily afford it? What would, what would you do to ensure that you know, the infrastructure of electricity is still provided nationally and widely as, as widely as possible? Well, I think that the, just the, the ultimate um, uh, client of electricity would draw from a municipality. It mm. makes sense. Uh, all of the municipalities have what are called lifeline tariffs, and, and we have them uh, in the cities that we govern. The problem with those tariffs is that we're at the mercy of NERSA and ESKIM, who hike them every single year and make it harder for us to actually provide more free electricity to those who really need the safety net. Um, I think that by introducing competition, allowing municipalities to contract directly with independent power producers or other players, will bring down the cost of electricity, will increase the supply, and will allow municipalities to broaden rather than narrow that social relief package that's required. And so let's move on to education. Um, so what is the DA's plan to change the dismal state of the education system of the country? Well, I think we've, we've got to start by deciding you know, what type of education system we want um, and how uh, we can use the education system to produce school leavers who have some form of skills and can contribute to the economy. I think our education system is outdated. I think we still teach on a Victorian level. Um, when large parts of the world have moved on, places like Taiwan uh, that I visited start the education system from ECD level using a model of problem solving. It's so rather than rote learning, and rote learning may have its place and times tables, etc. But they, they present a set of problems and they ask people to solve them. And I think that's a far more innovative way. One of the things I think needs to happen is for us to rebuild the education pipeline in South Africa. Currently, it's, uh, it's split up from ECD, basic education, high education. I think you should have one pipeline that is starting at an ECD level where everyone now agrees that you've got to get the fundamentals right all the way through to the, to the higher education level. I think you've got to allow people to separate out far earlier into a technical vocation rather than a traditional English um, uh, uh, literary uh, type of, of education. And that you've got to treat blue collar professionals the same way you treat white collar professionals. That's how it works in advanced uh, economies around the world. Um, and you've got to encourage more people to go into the, the blue-collar sectors because that's absolutely essential for growth. But we've got to make sure that the skill set as well on the blue-collar side of the skills, the artisanal, uh, artisans and, and training section is given the same budget and, and status as the traditional uh, education system so that the two streams move together and, and there's dignity in both. And, you know, will the DA be able to, to deal with the stranglehold that the teachers' union has on the public education, do you think? Well, I think we've done a, a relatively good job of, it, uh, of reining it in in the, in the Western Cape. Um, we've the only province that's introduced teacher, um, teacher continuous assessment um, mm. to make sure that you've got quality educators. And there's no point having someone teaching mathematics to students when they couldn't pass the exam that they've set uh, or, or, or even solve some of the problems. So you've got to have that, that ongoing teacher assessment. I think we must break the stranglehold of the unions. I think teaching must be considered an essential service. And I don't think that teachers should be allowed to put the lives and future of young uh, learners at risk uh, for through industrial action, for instance. I also think that teachers need to be in the classroom teaching. They mustn't be sitting at union meetings during school time. That should be kept for after hours and, and weekends. Far too many teachers are absent from the classroom and uh, learners are losing out on that uh, very important time. And um, do you, you don't think that there's going to be a difference in, for example, you know, that you've been in government in the Western Cape for a very long time and mm -hmm. have allowed, that's allowed you to 
put a f more of a foothold here, you don't think that there'll be more difficulty when trying to translate some of these results into the national level? No, but I think they work. I mean, that, that's the thing. And that's why it was so important for the DA to win power at a local level and a provincial level, because it provides in a petri dish for you to try alternatives and to model alternatives. Mm -hmm. And whether it's the social housing policy that we now have a life, living, breathing model of at Conradi and Pinelands, uh, to what we've been able to do in the education sector, all of these are very clear indicators that our policies work and that they can make a difference. And it would only make sense to extrapolate them to a national level uh, when we get international government because these are tried and tested policies. That's a very good answer, I would say. Um, and so let's move then to something that you kind of already hinted at, but you've been very vocal about the importance of providing broad employment to South Africans. Um, and one of the things you mentioned was to bring the standard of uh, the trade schools and uh, the blue collar work up to this kind of the white collar standard. But how would you provide broad employment given that the, there's been a failure of the education system to provide adequate skills to the youth of the country for so long? Yeah, so I think that you've got to do a number of things. The first thing you've got to get the growth going and that can only come through a better uh, more established investor friendly environment and i think we've got some of the most investor unfriendly policies in the world um, that would make it mad for someone to come and invest in south africa why would you come and build a factory here if you're going to have expropriation without compensation why would you would you invest in the country if the banks were to be nationalized so all these things are huge push factors away from the country at a time when emerging market economies that are our peers are doing their best to be able to attract that type of investment. But once you have that investment, you've got to be able to, and you get that economic growth going, you've got to have the skills in the economy to fuel it. Mm -hmm. So look back at the 2010 World Cup. It was probably one of the last times we had major infrastructure projects um, outside of the Gau train. Um, and what that was very, very uh, uh, clear about was the fact that we had to import skilled artisans in from Bangladesh, from India, from China, to be able to complete the work at those stadiums. And it doesn't make sense that, which br brings me back to the point that we've got to make sure that the type of people that we're pushing out of the, the schooling system are equipped with the type of skills that you need to compete in the modern economy. And that not everyone needs to have a corner office, you know, overlooking uh, overlooking a park and and have you know share options that you need the skilled people that are going to fuel that economic growth because even if we were to find oil uh, in huge amounts in the middle of South Africa and suddenly we were you know our economy is growing at six to eight percent if you don't have the skilled workers to, to sustain that growth and that that opportunity and to exploit it you're going to end up with a problem so one of the other things that Bots something that Botswana has done is where they lack those skills, they bring them in for a short term from other countries that have those skills, and you are required to work alongside and train a, a, a person from Botswana to perform those skills. I think we could quite easily do something like that in South Africa where you are able to impart those technical skills relatively easily and quickly working with people who are here. But then you've got to have a regime of skilled immigration, which South Africa doesn't have. So you, um, you talked about uh, the fact that South Africa is a very uh, investor-unfriendly uh, environment, mentioning uh, the nationalization of banks, the expropriation without compensation. But I'm also wondering, do the current labor laws of South Africa impede business growth and development as well? Without a doubt. And it, it's absurd if you look at the situation. We have got a labor regime for the type of economy we want to have but not for the economy that currently exists. So we've got first world standards in a, in a developing economy. And it's a complete mismatch. And what it's done is disincentivize employment, which is why we sit with a 42% unemployment rate, why we sit with over 70% of our young people without work. People are not incentivized to hire people in the country because it takes 126 steps to get rid of somebody for gross incompetence in this country. So. If people can't fire you relatively easily, if you don't perform, they're not going to hire you. And, and we've seen businesses, corporates, um, industry mechanizing, paring down, trying to get you know people to do more. 
rather than hire more people. Hiring people is the last resort. It should be the first resort in the country. Also, particularly for small business owners, one of the most devastating things is that a collective bargaining system is applied to you when you don't even have a seat at that table. So decisions made in a collective bargaining environment are then imposed upon you as a small business owner, and you've had no say in it. And we've seen what that does. It disincentivizes employment. So there's two things you can do. Uh, one thing is to just deregulate the labor market, uh, build a set of labor uh, regulations that are far simpler and, and make it far easier to employ people, or to do one of the things that we're calling for, which is a devolution of your labor regime to different provinces. So let the Western Cape decide it's on its labor regime and, you know, and, and to be able to then make it more investor friendly if it, if it wants to do that. <coughs> and uh, have you been successful in the devolution process? Well, we've started with policing and, and rail, but it's, it's, it's the argument we keep making that if you devolve, it makes sense to decentralize and devolve and to allow for regional uh, differentiation. It's how most federal countries work, and, and whether you're a, 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 one of the lander in Germany or whether you're a, a state in the United States of America, you've got a say on how your labor regime in that particular e economy will work. And it's one of the major leverages that, that states and regions have to be able to attract investment into, into them and create more jobs. So uh, we'll move away, I think, from, the, uh, from talking about employment to something that uh, you have been very vocal on your SONA and in your response to SONA and in, in kind of it, is, it has been something that you have told the public that about time and time again is the systemic corruption in the country. And South Africa could be described as a kleptocracy in many ways, um, especially the national government. And so I would, was wondering, what is the DA's plan to deal with the large-scale corruption that blights this country? So there's a number of things you have to do. The first thing is to have a consequence framework. So when wrongdoing is done, there is a consequence for it. And South Africa has no shortage of excellent legislation. The Public Finance Management Act, the Municipal Finance Management Act, the Public Audit Act, all of these are great pieces of legislation, and they've got harsh penalties for people who, who are responsible for corruption. But they never apply it. There's never consequences for people who, who are caught uh, stealing public money. They just simply get moved on to another department or another sphere of government and they carry on doing what they're doing. So until you have a consequence framework that applies to the very top and the very bottom, you're not going to be able to move the needle on corruption. Um, one of the uh, least corrupt places on earth, South Korea, has a consequence network where their former president, Park Geun-hye, was implicated in corruption. She was sentenced to 24 years in jail, the time between charges laid and sentencing, one year. We've been trying to get Jacob Zuma held accountable for what he did wrong, 783 charges of fraud, corruption and racketeering for the last 12 years. It's been trying to keep him, uh, to get him to court and to, to get him behind bars where he belongs. So you lack a consequence framework. The second thing you need is an ability of an, of the, of an agency to be able to detect and prosecute corruption properly. And this was one of the real tragedies of South Africa with the disbandment of the Scorpions. Because what the Scorpions did was, in a multidisciplinary way, bring together prosecutors, investigators, police members, forensic accountants, uh, you know, advocates into a team that was able to build a case from the ground up and secure convictions, which is why they had a 90% conviction rate. It works. And that's why they were disbanded, because they started to get too successful. So I would, I would have the consequence network, but you need a framework that's going to make sure you secure prosecutions. The NPA, I'd, at the moment, I don't believe has the ability to be able to even begin prosecuting some of these high-profile cases, which is why people like Marcus used to remain you know, out, outside of prison. Uh, no one in the NPA would even be able to understand how that case works. Whereas you've got an agency like the Scorpions, which we would reintroduce, uh, that was able to work in a multidisciplinary way to build rock-solid cases, bringing together all those strands of prosecution, detection, investigation into a single agency. And then to put some very high-profile heads on spikes, when you put 
power profile heads on spikes, it sends a very clear message out that things have changed, that you know, if it can happen to Jacob Zuma, it can happen to me, and that nobody is immune from being held accountable in the country. And how do we deal with the backlog in corruption cases within the country? How do we expedite this process? Because surely, you know, it, it's all well and good to create a, a top quality uh, anti-corruption unit. But if the courts are so choked with corruption cases to get through in such a backlog, then what are we going to do in that situation? So dedicated corruption courts where you can even bring in retired judges and they like to come in and assist and deal with that backlog. Um, but what I would do if I was Shamila Batoy, I would be picking a number of very high profile uh, cases that are low hanging fruit where I'm pretty convinced I can secure a conviction. And I would go hard after those cases and, and I would make sure that they're prosecuted to the full extent of the law and that you focus on getting those cases done. Um, and thirdly, um, you know, you obviously have to overhaul the way the court system works. It's far too uh, arduous, far too clogged up, far too um, congested for you to be able to deal with. So that's why you, you should have specialized courts, for instance, a corruption court, municipal courts, etc., so that you can separate out uh, what's going on. But it means you're going to have to dramatically as well improve the NPA's budget and ability to be able to do what it, what it needs to do to secure those prosecutions. And <clears throat> also to then reverse some of the damage that's been done due to state capture into these important institutions as well, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, you've got to firewall those institutions uh, from the scourge of state capture ever happening again, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons we've taken such a hard line against CADA deployments, why we're going to the Concord to have it declared unconstitutional, because CADA deployment was the means by which state capture could take place. You couldn't capture those departments until you had put your people into those departments. So we believe CADA deployment, for instance, is one of the root causes of state capture, which is why we're so intent on, on, on closing down that, that door so it can't be used again. Uh, but it does mean that you've got to find ways as well within government departments and state-owned entities to make sure that they're firewalled from it ever happening uh, again. Mm. And this is why I'm frustrated that we're dragging our feet on Zondo. Our parliament's not engaged with the Zondo Commission report at all. Uh, we should have been well within the work now in doing precisely that firewalling that's required. We're still waiting for the president to table the report in parliament. Why that needs to happen, I don't know. It's out there, it's public knowledge, everyone can see it, you can download it off the internet. Why do you have to wait for the president to come and tell you that, okay, you can start you know, making, the, uh, making the necessary interventions? Um, and I think the sooner we get cracking on Zondo and the sooner we get busy firewalling those institutions, the better, because it shouldn't matter whether you're an ANC government, a DA government or EFF government, what happened in the last decade must never be allowed to happen again. Would, I would strongly agree with that. But to draw then this back to this conversation back to your party, how does the DA safeguard against corruption within the party? So I would start off from the point saying that there's no institution in the country, whether it's a Rotary Club, a church, or a government department, is ever can say it is immune to corruption. Mm. And I think it's how you deal with the cases when they emerge that you must be judged by. And every single time we've had an issue with people who've behaved in a manner that doesn't fit the, you know, the DA's uh, expectation of public representatives, we've taken action against them. It wasn't easy for us, for instance, to fire the mayor of Cape Town. It was a very costly process and a very uh, arduous process that hurt us electorally. Mm -hmm. But I believe at the end of the day, um, you if you don't take that action and you turn a blind eye, that will end up costing you far more politically down the road. To the point where, this is where the ANC finds itself today. It's turned it's a blind eye to corruption within its ranks so much over the last two decades that everybody knows everybody else's, as Batabile said, small and young skeleton. So you can't act against anybody. Yeah. You've got to act without fear and favor when it happens and remove those people. So, for instance, we had a provincial leader who had been less than honest about his qualifications in the Western Cape, and you know, he did the honourable thing and, and resigned. Uh, we're taking action against the speaker currently in the Western Cape provincial legislature who 
the provincial uh, colleagues don't doesn't don't believe has behaved in a way that befits uh, his office. So we, it's how you deal with these things when they emerge and when the allegations come to light, but also about having due process. And uh, that's the one thing the DA has got after 15 years of you know hard slog. We've built up our own internal procedures where there's a fair, fair opportunity to be heard and to put your case. But our Federal Legal Commission makes findings and those findings are respected by everybody within the party. So I want to move on um, <clears throat> to talking about uh, your last uh, national manifesto, given that it was the manifesto, the most recent national manifesto, and the most mm -hmm. and the elections coming up, the national elections, and in that um, manifesto you outlined the policy of platform of the DA is based around achieving uh, the 19 sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. Uh, I realize that uh, this manifesto was made under your, your <laughs> predecessor and not necessarily under you. Um, but I would say well, while the uh, sustainable development goals are certainly good and noble to try to achieve, do you believe that it is realistic for a government to focus on 19 different goals simultaneously? I think that many of those goals are aspirational in, in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that... Uh, if you looked at the what, what, in the previous incarnation, I think there were the Millennium Development yeah. Goals. Uh, many of them were not achieved. Um, I think they're, they're a set of aspirational goals that you should be trying to achieve, but I, I don't think that given South Africa's context where we find ourselves and that, that all, all 17 are going to be, are going to be achieved, um, I, I don't think so. Um, I also don't think that you know, each country's got different... Uh, different challenges and, and different environments and that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach where you can take one set of goals and just shoehorn them onto, onto everybody. Uh, countries will have different responses to, to those ways in, in terms of their unique circumstances. So if you were to cut down the list of sustainable development goals to a top five to kind of match the mm. South African context at the best, what they what would they be and why? Mm. So, I mean, I think the first one is energy for, for us. I mean, yeah. you can't grow an economy, you can't create jobs, and you can't shift the needle on unemployment if you don't have functioning uh, electricity. Eskim also presents one of the biggest challenges on our balance sheet, one of the biggest risks to the South African balance sheets and, and uh, from a debt perspective. So I would, I would get energy right. Dealing with poverty and hunger is also absolutely essential. We've got 30 million South Africans who live below the poverty line. It's not sustainable. Uh, you cannot have an economy where you have so many people locked out of opportunity and are unable to provide for themselves and their families. Um, sustainable services, government services, I think are very important, particularly for poorer South Africans. Uh, wealthier South Africans can always find an alternative mode of service delivery. If you don't mm -hmm. like the, what the police are doing, you go and hire a private security company. You don't like the quality of education at government schools, you can send your kids to private schools. You don't like what's on SABC, you can get Netflix. For poor South Africans, they've got no choice. They are reliant on those government services. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to lift people out of poverty and into opportunity, those services then lie at the heart of it. Um, Health care as well is absolutely essential, and education. Um, I, I, don't, I think if one looks at the ladder of opportunity, um, having a healthy body, making sure that you're, that you, that you're able to uh, work productively is essential, and for that you need decent health care. And education, and we've spoken a lot about education as well. Um, and I, I, I see it as one of the major steps on, on the ladder of prosperity. So, and I want to talk to you kind of about one of the tensions that seemed to arise when you were talking about it, is that you, you were talking about sustainability and energy provision at the same time. And now I'm wondering, in your opinion, what, what wins out here? Do we want to give, to provide energy as cheaply as possible, even if that means engaging in the use of fossil fuels? Uh, uh, over for a longer period of time to keep the energy as as cheap as possible, or do we want to to focus on creating a sustainable society? Well, I think that I think that the problem that we have in South Africa is that if we think we're going to be able to just switch off from coal overnight, um, we're going to drive the cost of electricity up. 
to a point where it becomes really unaffordable, particularly in the current context. So I see coal being a part of the South African energy mix for at least the next decade. And I think that uh, whilst it would be great to switch it off tomorrow, the reality on the ground is that it, it just won't it won't be possible. The, I don't think that the independent power producers and green energy is at the level yet from a price perspective where it'll be able to just instantly fill that gap. It is getting cheaper and it is getting better, but um, I think we've got to have the aspiration to get rid of fossil fuels. I think the reality is that they're going to be with us for, for, for a decade still. Is the DA in favour of the use of nuclear power? Well, we don't really have a party position. We're busy developing one and uh, through our policy unit. Um, I happen to, th my personal view is that I think nuclear is an option that we should be looking at. Um, I think if you look at, uh, from a clean energy perspective, and, and particularly from a baseload perspective, particularly if you're wanting to get rid of fossil fuels and off coal, you need something that's going to be able to replace that baseload. Yeah. At the moment, independent power producers and, and green energy can't provide that baseload. Mm -hmm. So you need something to replace that baseload. I think nuclear is an option that we should be looking at. Should it be Russian nuclear? I would say no, but I think there's plenty of other... Uh, nuclear providers around the world who provide really world-class products. And I think that if you look at the transition away from nuclear uh, in places like Germany and, and others, uh, who are now you know, taking many of those nuclear plants out of the mothball phase because they've realized that with an energy crisis because of the natural gas problem with, uh, with Russia, that you know, it, perhaps it wasn't wise to just simply shut down the nuclear option the time. So I do believe that, that it should be part of an energy mix going forward. And so I want to move on to some of the hurdles that the DA faced. And one of the major hurdles that the DA faces is that what has become to come to be known as the black suit, with, with uh, a few cases of notable members of color leaving the party under various circumstances. Missy Maimani, Patricia Little, Herman Rashavo, Mbali Natuli, Andrew Lowe, Patricia Kapane, to name a few. So why does the DA, why has the DA such a problem holding on to this black leadership? Well, uh, first of all, I think that it's it's completely over exaggerated. Mm. Um, the EFF's parliamentary caucus has they've they've got rid of seventy five percent of their MPs, all of whom were black, um, over the course of the last four years, and no one said there's an exit there. Uh, Herman Mashaba's entire KwaZulu Natal leadership, who were all black, left the party. Um, his he's got people in Gauteng who've left the party. Nobody makes a noise about it. The reality is that it is an obsession with the DA and around race, when, as all the latest polling shows, we are by far the most diverse party in terms of representativity and also amongst our voter base, where the majority of our voter base is not white, and people forget that. I think that it was a natural thing that was going to happen. Um, the DA lost its way in 2019, it tried to become an ANC light. It tried to pick fights with its traditional voter base. It um, adopted some policy positions, which were about as clear as mud. I think a lot of people looked at the DA and said, well, I don't know if this is a party that speaks for me or represents me anymore. And we paid for that electorally with the first reversal in elections since 1994. And you can do one of two things when that happens. You can say, well, it was an outlier election, we're just going to keep on doing the same thing and hope to achieve a different result. Or you can listen to the message that voters sent you and adjust accordingly. So when I became leader, I said, we're going to recommit ourselves to those core values and principles that have guided this party through terrible times before and have always sustained us. And so naturally, there are people that had joined in an era where we were moving the party towards being an ANC light who now find themselves you know, less than comfortable. Um, there are also people who, in some of those instances, were not able to fulfill their personal ambitions in the party and were thwarted uh, with those. And, you know, they've obviously left and the DA was good enough for them when they were drawing a salary. It's suddenly a terrible place. I think one of them described it as a prison. Well, you know, the door's always been open. So, you know, a nice prison with a a million rand a year package and, and all the benefits that go with it. Uh, and, you know, suddenly you've been on this Damascus road that you've now realized it was all terrible and, and a prison. So I think you ought to take with a truckload of salt some of the things people say when they're leaving. But 
the reality is many, many more people are joining and many more people, you know, not to use and say that they're envoys of their race, but our new chief whip in parliament, for instance, Saviwe Garube, is a young black South African woman from a rural part of the Eastern Cape. And she's there because she's excellent, not because she's black. Um, Soli Malazzi, our national spokesperson, again, he's black. He's a great spokesperson, I think one of the best spokespersons any party has. There's people joining the DA, there's stars all over the country. And I think to focus on a couple of disgruntled members who don't like the way in which things are happening or they've had their personal ambition sorted and to use that as some sort of stick to beat the party with, I think is a little bit uh, rich. I also make the final point that people say, oh, well, you know, the DA, you know, is this and that the next thing. Look at our top six. It's the most diverse top six in the country. You've got black, white, colored and Indian in the top six. The ANC's is monochromatic. The Freedom Front's is monochromatic. The EFF's is monochromatic. It's, the DA stands out as the example of non-racialism, where you've got Hindu with Jew, Christian with Muslim. And we're, I'm very proud of that diversity. And as, I'm not going to allow the, I'm not going to allow a few sour apples who haven't got their way to, to derogate from the really excellent work being done by many, many of our people around the country, the majority of whom are black South Africans. And I hate to take you into another scandal, which I think uh, I can, I know, might know your answer to, but uh, you faced a, a recent backlash about a joke that you made about your wife on the Mac G, ex-wife on the Mac G podcast, which many people, particularly women, have found to be in that best, extremely bad taste. Um, do you regret the joke, given the sensitivity in this country surrounding issues of violence against women? Well, first of all, I don't think that there was anything in the joke that promoted violence against women. Mm. It was a throwaway comment. It was, it was in very bad taste. I will concede that. Uh, but goodness me, I mean, out of an hour and 18 uh, you know, minutes podcast, for the media to jump on that one thing, I think was a little bit much. Also, I think that it's been blown disproportionately out of context. Um, how do you take a bad joke and you know say to somebody, oh, well, you should lose your job over that? But we once quite happy to let Becky clearly continue in office of sort of saying women are lucky to be raped, that no one's calling for the finance minister to be removed uh, because of his escapades with a massage. And, and, and certainly, you know, the president's sitting there with millions of dollars stuffed in his couch. I think that the I think the faux rage brigade uh, were the ones driving that. And I think it's very interesting to go and have a look at the comments underneath many of the articles that have been written, mm. where the public themselves are saying, but hang on, you know, this was a, you know, this was a joke, albeit it was bad taste, and I probably shouldn't have made it. But this is also a podcast where, you know, you're entitled to, to, you know, to, to let your hair down and, and be a little bit uh, risque. Yeah. Um, I think that we mustn't, we mustn't expect our politicians to be robots. We're not. We're human beings just like the people listening to this podcast. We make mistakes. We say things we regret sometimes. We make bad jokes. <laughs> you know, uh, and I think if, you, if you're wanting to elect robots, well, they must design a robot then to sit in Parliament. Uh, we're humans and we're, we suffer the same fallibilities as every other human being uh, in the country. Do you think that the DA faces a hostile media? Absolutely. Uh, we, we, you know, we, particularly the mainstream media, love to you know, love to bash the DA. It makes them feel good, and I think there are particular journalists who make a cottage industry out of criticizing the DA. But you know what? It doesn't bother me. Uh, I don't want to be held to the same standard as the ANC. If the media want to hold us to a higher standard, so be it. We will aspire to to meet it. I do think, however. Some of the criticism is deeply unfair. Mm. And, I mean, I don't expect any media house to roll over and tickle our tummy. Um, you know, I expect to be held to account. But I do think some of the criticism uh, of some of the media commentary is gratuitously unfair. Mm. And it's not a standard which, which they hold anybody else accountable to. So why do you think there is such a media obsession with the DA then? Because uh, to virtue signal that they are cool or, you know, or progressive. You know, you bash a party because it, you know, it makes you 
virtue signal to others that you that you're doing a, a great job. And I think a lot of people in the mainstream media write for their own echo chamber, their own internal audience. So Eusebius MacKaiser will write for Feral Hafferji, and Feral Hafferji will write for Rebecca Davis, and Rebecca Davis will be right for Richard Popblack. And they go out to try and you know, uh, you know, out, you know, outwoke each other about who can be the most, uh, you know, egregious about the DA. And, you know, that's fine. The reality is they write us off every election. They say the DA is going to die. They keep saying that, you know, it's the end of the road for the DA. They keep finding a new party every election that's going to overtake the DA and be the official opposition. And every election they're proven wrong. And being a journalist means never having to say you're sorry you know, after <laughs> the stuff you've said about parties in the run-up to an election. And I love proving them wrong every single election. Um, so I want to move on talking about elections and proving the media wrong. Because uh, uh, one of the, the predictions especially that's been espoused um, by the media is that it's very, it might be likely that uh, come 2024 we will finally see a coalition in national government um, but the DA, as we've mentioned earlier, has been in coalition and governments and municipalities and wards all across the country now. Um, and you outlined uh, some of the difficulties earlier. Um, but what have you learned about the possibility of coalition governance from these experiences? Yeah, so I, mean, I think that we've been in coalition school for the last uh, eight, eight or so years. And I divide the coalition periods into coalition 1.0 and coalitions 2.0. Coalition 1.0 started with the 2016 election, mm -hmm. where I think the DA uh, leadership ran into many of these uh, coalitions for expedient purposes, rather than uh, on a principled basis, and and got our fingers burnt. So the coalitions with EFF in Johannesburg, for instance, mm -hmm. we very soon started having to dance to the EFF's tune, and the uh, rent-seeking began, the, uh, you know, the uh, influence peddling began <coughs> and there's only one thing worse than not getting into government that's getting into government governing badly and, and not according to your values and principles so we learned a lot of lessons through to coalition 1.0 coalition 2.0 started in the 21 elections and having learned the lessons from those coalitions before uh, we adopted a completely different approach we said from the beginning we will only go into coalitions with people who shared the values and principles of non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a social market economy and, and building a capable state. And and that precluded parties, for instance, like the EFF, who we said up front we won't go into a coalition because of the experience that we'd had. It also came down to the experience when we negotiated the coalition agreements. Mm. No coalition formed without a written coalition agreement. Uh, a handshake is not worth much in politics. Um, the... Um, the coalitions were therefore negotiated starting not with positions but with the core values and principles, a common program of action, the red lines about what would be tolerated and not tolerated within, and then finally we did the positions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was a far healthier situation and I think the coalitions are, that, are, that have come out of Coalition 2.0 are far more stable and sustainable than the ones that went before and I've no doubt that the national and provincial coalitions are going to have learnt the lessons from both of those, and I think we'll start to see a coalition. And there will definitely be a coalition government after uh, after this next election. We're going to end 74 years of one-party domination, years under the Nats, and now the ANC we're finally going to have a true multi-party democracy, I believe. Well, let's hope, uh, let's sure hope so. Um, and, but I'll, another question about the coalitions and what you've learnt is, how do you integrate and respect the views of the other parties in your coalition? I think that you've, you've got to, to, to listen to, to what the other parties are saying. And I think we've been eminently fair in the way in which we've dealt with the other coalition partners. We've, you know, we've understood that the, the coalition project is essential because we have to demonstrate before 2024 to voters that this is a viable way for parties to put aside their differences and to come together in the best interest of the voters. And it, it's meant that we've had to give away some positions that we would not like to have given away. But you understand that in the, you know, in the, in the service of keeping the coalition together and keeping people on board, that those are necessary. I mean, it's about learning as well to, to, 
to be more collaborative. And you know I'm saying we haven't been perfect. We've made some mistakes, and uh, but other parties have too. But I, I definitely think that that the coalition environment is a lot healthier now than it was uh, in any time before, and mm. and that we're we're getting better and learning. So before moving on to um, the DA's beliefs and, and prospects for coalitions come 2024, I want to talk about um, the prospect of an EFF ANC coalition governing the country because one of the things that's happened recently, as I'm sure you're well aware, is that Julius Malema has come out and said that he would be willing to, to negotiate a coalition with uh, the ANC in 2024, and what do you think about this prospect for the country? Well, I think that it's it's very interesting if you look at the full extent of what he said, mm. provided Sora Maposa is not the president, and I think he said I think he said with Paul Mashatili or someone like that. So Mr. Malema has realised that he's not going to be the president of the country, which is his ultimate aspiration. With the EFF, I mean they've hit a ceiling of between 12 and 13 percent. They won't get any more than that, and that's certainly where all the polling's putting them as well. So to get the presidency, he's got to be part of something bigger. So I think what you will see is that if that were to happen, an ANC-EFF tie-up, and heaven help us if that happens, because the country's economy uh, will will go to hell in a handbasket pretty quickly. There'll be massive capital flight, and really uh, the, the rent seekers will be in charge because it'll essentially become a reverse takeover of the ANC, because the Malema faction or the EFF will will uh, make common cause with the RET faction, and mm -hmm. they will push out people like Ramaphosa, Gondangwana, Pandor, Gordon, and others, uh, mm -hmm. and replace them with with RET people, the Glamini Zoomers of the world, the uh, Arthur Frasers of the world, the, you know, sort of, um, there's a whole host of them. So. I think that that they need to be very, very careful. Uh, the ANC needs to be careful because they could end up being consumed by them. If one looks just how much the EFF were able to extract from the ANC from the opposition benches, drawing them down the rabbit hole of expropriation without compensation, state bank, uh, NHI, all, all of these things where the ANC has been pulled down the rabbit hole by the EFF. Imagine now when they're reliant on the EFF for votes, how that is going to accelerate. And those Chavez socialist style policies, I think, will be the death knell for South Africa's future viability. More people fall into poverty. Inequality will deepen and uh, it will become a pretty miserable environment. So I, I think that it's not as cut and dry as Mr. Milema thinks. Um, certainly there are uh, elements in the ANC, significant elements, that realize that a tunadering with the EFF spells the end of the road for them and their mm. and their careers, and so I wouldn't take it as a given that that's where the ANC uh, is necessarily headed as well. So um, to move then to what the DA is projecting for 2024, in the event that the ANC does fall below 50% of the vote and comes in minority in the 2024 elections, would you be willing to join a coalition government with them? Well, not in their current form. I mean, I think that uh, that the ANC in its current form does not meet the standards of those those four key values and principles, and they've demonstrated that. And uh, a capable state lies at the heart of being able to deliver, and they've done everything to prevent us having a capable state in the country. So I don't foresee it. Mm. Whether the ANC is in its current form by the time the election rolls around is another thing altogether. It's a very important Congress later this year. Uh, in December, an elective Congress, and when you talk to people in the radical economic transformation section uh, of that party, they say they've got the votes. The, the reform factor people say they've got the votes, and the tide's going to go out in December, and you're going to see who's swimming without swimming trunks on, and I think that's going to be very interesting to see the balance of forces. But there will be a victor, and there will be a vanquished after that conference, and where that leads to a further split in the ANC, remains to be seen. Uh, I don't think the centre can hold there for much longer. I think people like Ramaphosa have to realise that their reform agenda or their economic uh, policy or, or platform is completely destroyed while they've got the RET faction holding to it and, and that they've got to break away to, to do that. So I think a lot's going to happen in these next two years. that will mm -hmm. open up exciting possibilities. But certainly the ANC in its current form we couldn't be in government with people that have David Mishlobo and 
uh, you know, David Didi Mabuza, and that uh, within their senior ranks, it would be pretty much doing what the MDC did with ZANU PF, which is breathe life into a, you know, a completely moribund organisation that mm -hmm. deserves to be turned into a minority party. Uh, and are there any other parties that you would be unwilling to join a coalition with? Well, them? the EFF. I mean, we've been very, very clear. I mean, if you look at those core values of that I've spoken about, mm -hmm. non-racialism, yeah. respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a social market economy and a and capable state, state, they are the antithesis of that. Mm -hmm. And their policies are the antithesis of achieving those things. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would rather be a strong opposition and an excellent uh, party articulating and holding them accountable than being in government with a party like the EFF. And any of the, the smaller parties or do they? Well we're willing to talk to anybody who shares those core values and principles and I, th I think that will be the first test for us. Um, there's a variety of small parties, there's probably going to be a proliferation of new smaller parties and independents that, that pitch up. Mm. Um, what you don't want to do is to, is to throw everything off the table. Uh, you know, particularly when it comes to, the, to, to forming coalitions, but you have to be circumspect when the time comes around about making sure you're doing business with people that A, you can trust, and B, share your values and principles. Otherwise, there's no point being in government. It's better to be in opposition. And as uh, the government is currently construed, and maybe with the inclusion of something like an Action SA or a One SA movement, are there any parties that you are excited about the prospect of bringing on as coalition partners? Um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, One South Africa Movement is not really a party. I mean, mm. it's called One South Africa Movement because there's only one South African at the part of it. <laughs> and um, you know, Action SA have still got uh, they've still got a bit of uh, you know still of testing to do. And I think that they need to decide whether their job is to help bring the NC below fifty percent or mm. to weaken the opposition. And if one looks at some of the positions they've taken over recent times, they seem more intent on trying to harm the DA than on, on, on reducing the NC share of the vote. And I think it's unfortunate because uh, I think they would be a good partner in the project to, to bring the ANC below 50% and to bring change in South Africa. Um, mm. But, you know, we, we are working with them in, in coalitions, but it would be great if they, if they took their focus off the DA and made it far more on on taking the fight to the ANC, I think it would be far more helpful. But, you know, I mean, we, we, we're in coalition with different parties and different permutations all over the country. Um, there's some parties we're in coalition with in the Western Cape that we're not in coalition with in other places. Um, but the ACDP and the Freedom Front have both proven to be excellent coalition partners. Mm -hmm. um, they stick to their word and their agreements, except for their rogue council in Joburg, but they've dealt with that person. Um, and. I think that they've proven to, over a long period of time, that they can be trusted uh, to, to govern with and govern well. And so, um, <coughs> to kind of summarize a lot of what we've been talking today, I've got a final two questions for you. Um, and firstly, what do you think is the f future of the opposition in South Africa? Well, I hope the future of the opposition is the EFF and the ANC. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, I think that's that's where the future of the opposition has got to be because we want to be in government. I, I think that you you understand once you've taken control in places like a city and towns or a province that you're really only able to get things done properly when when you're in the driving seat. And I, I'm calling this next election a moonshot election for the party and and for South Africa because I fundamentally believe. That another five years of ANC rule, or another five years of ANC EFF rule, uh, there won't be much left in 2029 to to govern. Uh, so it is imperative that we that we get it right this particular election. And I really hope the future of the opposition is going to be some of those parties, because that's what's healthy for democracy. Uh, it's very likely the Conservative Party in Britain are going to be on the opposition benches after the next election. Mm -hmm. um, that that you know, the Republicans will lose control of you know of, of some state houses. That's how you get the health in democracy, where people realise that there is a prospect of them losing office. It forces parties as well to behave better. So I think it'll be a good thing for democracy to see the ANC and the EFF on on the opposition benches and and another party or set of parties and on the government benches and. People then have five years to judge 
them. And if they don't do what they say they're going to do, then they get an opportunity to, to chuck them out and move, on to, the and move on to the next ones. And I think that's what a healthy democracy is all about. And so in short, why should South African voters vote for the DA? Well, I think it's, it's very simple. I mean, we've got a proven track record. Uh, we don't have to come and make promises. We can show you where we govern, that we've, we've delivered. We've delivered a capable state in the Western Cape. Uh, we've delivered clean, or accountable government in the cities and towns where we govern. Uh, and it's not a Western Cape phenomenon. Places like Midval is the cleanest uh, government in Gauteng. Um, we've proven that we can get things done. And I think in an election where South Africans need to make a choice about their future, to trust a party with a proven track record of getting things done. There's going to be plenty of shiny new baubles that pop up and promise the world. But judge them on, on, on what they've been able to achieve, and very few of them have achieved anything. Look at the DA. We're not perfect. We've made mistakes. But we are a party that has proven that we can get people into work, that we can grow an economy, that we can deliver clean and accountable government, and that life gets better where the DA governs. We've done it where we govern in these places. We want to do it for the whole of South Africa now. And if that's not a compelling enough reason, then, then I don't know what is. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, John, for mm -hmm. taking the time to talk to me today. It was a fascinating conversation, and uh, I'm so happy that uh, I had the opportunity to talk to you. Well, thank you. The privilege is, is mine, and thank you very, very much for what I thought were very thoughtful questions that I wish the mainstream media would ask uh, more of instead of uh, focusing on personalities and vendettas. <laughs> that is <laughs> so kind.